Hi everyone, my name is Carolyn Hogg from the University of Sydney and welcome to module 3.1 about co-design and engagement and I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge Kate Quigley from the Mindaroo Foundation uh, and Adam Stowe from Quarry University who also contributed to this presentation. <coughs> so what we're going to talk about today is co-design, uh, how to identify your stakeholders and a little bit about adaptive management. So co-development and co-design is really key to any successful conservation management project. This is not about a project around conservation genetics. And this is really highlighted in the new global biodiversity framework, where an approach to biodiversity conservation fully integrates uh, an effective participation from Indigenous peoples and local communities, calls for full and effective participation of all stakeholders. And really the weaving of traditional voices into conservation has been a very long time coming, particularly here in Australia. So co-design is really key to this. <clears throat> and what you need to do is what is the end user question and what information do your end users really need? Um, and how do you go about this with proact? It's really about proactive engagement with stakeholders, uh, not just your conservation end users and your Indigenous peoples and local communities, but also those members of the research community, as each member will bring new and different knowledge uh, to the conversation and, and inform the way you'll be undertaking your project moving forward. It's also about <coughs> access, sorry, and utilisation as well as benefit sharing and sample processing and collection. Who's going to process those samples? Who's going to collect those samples? What is the long-term storage plan of those samples and the data that is generated? How do you plan on disseminating that research across uh, the research community as well as the end users and the stakeholders? And what will you do uh, once you come towards project uh, completion or continuation uh, about the samples, who's got access, how to utilize, utilize the information and where does the research end up? And if you're looking for a really uh, excellent roadmap or a way of being able to uh, undertake all the different steps that uh, make up a successful uh, co-design project, I highly re recommend looking at this paper produced by Anne McCartney and colleagues uh, in, in NPJ Biodiversity, which came out as an open access paper. And it really goes quite uh, thoroughly through each of the different uh, distinctive steps that make up a successful conservation genetics project. Uh, Kathy Bellov and my, myself, I uh, realised the benefits of co-designing a project with the Tasmanian Devil Project uh, when I was in conservation management at the Zealand Aquarium Association and Cathy was at the University of Sydney. And what we wanted to do was get away from this very traditional research conservation approach, which is quite linear, where you had a research idea, research funding, you conduct the work, your work may be uh, published, your publication may be read by a conservation manager who may decide to implement what you put in the research paper. There may be a management outcome which may or may not lead to a conservation outcome. And what Cathy and I wanted to do with the tools and tech approach was really, which is really the precursor for the Threat Species Initiative, is how do we integrate research and management better here in Australia? How do we take management questions and implement them directly into research ideas with academics and use the management funding and leverage that through the ARC linkage projects to get research funding and have a two-way conversation between academics and researchers and the management teams and end users who needed the information and so that the academics could continue on to do their research projects but the information could be provided in real time to permit adaptive management decisions which could lead to real world on the ground conservation outcomes. So we went about this, uh, and it, it's really about how to conduct co-design the project and, and well, where we started is what is the end user question? So what is the question that your end users, your conservation managers uh, actually need and what information do the, those end users need? But you also need to make sure that you meet the FAIR and CARE principles. Now, what do I mean by FAIR and CARE principles? I'll talk about that in a moment. But you also need to identify all your stakeholders and communicate the project requirements um, from the start point to the end point, what you think the costs are going to be uh, for each of those parties involved before you begin. And this includes both sample processing and collection, long-term storage of samples of data and dissemination of that research. And how are you going to communicate those real uh, project findings in real time as the project is underway, as uh, end users particularly do not want to be receiving uh, academic or research information at the last instant, but be able to adapt their uh, decision making processes as the project is being undertaken. And how are you going to communicate the project outputs as the project is completed? 
So as I said, one of the key things to take into account is the FAIR principle. And the FAIR principle is to make sure that the data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this is really about promoting equitable access and interoperability of the data process to make sure that those who come after you can use the information uh, that you've produced and that it actually uh, starts to contribute to long-term temporal data sets so we can look at what's happening in conservation management, particularly with genetic diversity, over a longer period of time. The CARE principle is about uh, collective benefit, the authority to control, responsibility for the data and the ethics of it. And it's really about promoting equitable Indigenous participation in the data processes as well. And so the care principles are very much around Indigenous engagement and allowing Indigenous uh, land peoples and local communities to have ownership over the species and uh, the, the data that is being generated. And FAIR is very much around the data processes being available across um, all the conservation and user community as well as the research communities. So one of the key things you need to do is identify your stakeholders uh, and you need to identify your identifying stakeholders can actually be quite a complex process and, and, and can take quite a period of time. And some of the questions you might need to consider is who's asking the question and why are they seeking the answer? Who owns the land where the samples are coming from? A large proportion of land in Australia is actually um, held in private hands. Which Indigenous country are the samples coming from, particularly if it's uh, in land that's managed and held by Indigenous communities? Who's paying for the project? Who has worked on the species before and who may be working on it now? So one of the easiest ways to understand about whose country you're on in Australia is to go look at the ATSIS map, which has actually clearly mapped out all the different communities in Australia. There is a diverse range, diversity across the different um, mobs across Australia. And there is a need to better understand the perceptions before moving forward. And Indigenous and local knowledge systems are connected and dependent on local context, but their impact may be uh, regional and globally relevant. So there is a large amount of uh, resources available to you these days in this space. Uh, one of the initial steps we would recommend is going to the ATSIS website and starting to learn about uh, the different ways that you can start planning engagement to build uh, positive relationships with the local community and stakeholders and elders. This is a very fast moving space here in Australia, so I highly recommend that you just go and do your homework. Does your organisation have a First Nation or Indigenous Affairs Manager or Advisor? If not, then I would recommend reaching out to your local Aboriginal Lands Corporation. What policies does your organisation that you work for have in relation to engaging with First Nations or Indigenous uh, peoples? What external permits are needed? This is not just external permits uh, such as ethics, but also uh, permits to be able to work on the lands in which you're working and with the communities that you're working with, as well as any state and national permits for working on the species. You need to familiar yourself with, uh, with familiarise yourself with a variety of different resources. And some of these at the moment are those produced by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, or ATSITS. Um, you can also look at the local uh, registered Native Title Bodies Corporation and Prescribed Body Corporations Act. And as I said, the space is ever changing. And really what we highly recommend is look for resources to understand more, do your research. There's a lots of uh, research available online. There's different protocols for using First Nations uh, cultural and intellectual property in the arts is a highly recommended place to look. It is developed for the arts, but can also be applied to the sciences. And there's also a range of formal learning that you can do through a variety of micro, micro certifications. So once you've identified your stakeholders and you've started to engage in a project of co-design, one of the other things that you need to consider, of course, is an adaptive management framework. An adaptive management framework is very much around how do you set goals, design and plan your project, implement your actions, monitor those actions, evaluate those actions, and then adapt your changes. So it's really a stepwise iterative process in which interventions are implemented, the effects are monitored and evaluated, and the next intervention is adapted according to the knowledge that you gain. So as with everything, there's a wide range of obstacles and things that you need to be aware of uh, when you're undertaking an adaptive management framework. And uh, Manson's paper in Trends in Ecology, which is another open access publication, has a really clear framework of the different main obstacles uh, that are really in relation to the adaptive management processes. And this is around setup, resources, methodology, 
understanding the process and knowledge exchange, but it's also about the ecosystem that you're choosing to work in, what's the knowledge of the ecosystem, the complexity of the system and the scale of it. And the third obstacle, main obstacle, is really around governance issues. So the four main types of capacities that you need to reduce these obstacles are structure and resources, you need collaboration, you need learning, and you need legal or institutional governance requirements. And so really when we're talking about structure and resources, we're talking about um, make sure that you've got sufficient resources for the, for the program from start to finish, that it's got a well-established and well-defined framework, um, that you can enable uh, spatio-temporal scales and you can enhance the different leadership through the project that you've got coordination between the stakeholders, you need to strengthen these stakeholder uh, relationships and communication is, is really key to being successful in an adaptive management framework. Key to it as well is allowing um, to enhance your understanding of the adaptive management process in the ecosystem, enable experimentation and facilitate learning and enhance monitoring. It's really important to ensure that you're very clear what your goals are at the beginning of the project, that you outline these with your stakeholders when you co-design the project, and then you actually go through a stepwise iterative process of testing and adapting as you go. And make sure that you're actually undertaking the work um, in a flexible legal framework but that you have both institutional and political support for what you're trying to achieve, particularly if you're trying to achieve large scale regional change. So when it comes to down to co-design and engagement, you need to identify your stakeholders early in the piece. You need to identify what are their questions and what are your questions and see whether they align and also talk about what values that you have and what values that they have and try and align your value system as best you can. You need to understand the legislative framework that you'll be working under and any restrictions that may be associated with this. Communication is essential. Uh, these large scale projects between academics and conservation end users and indigenous peoples and local communities cannot work without communication. And there's lots of resources available in this space around engagement, co-design, uh, engaging with Indigenous peoples and local communities, as well as adaptive management frameworks. And I highly recommend that you go and educate yourself in this space as it, it is a rapidly changing area. Investigate what's available, educate yourself, implement your learnings and communicate with everyone. So as with all the other projects, here's a short outline of the online course. We hope that you're enjoying it and acknowledge uh, all the contributors uh, to the TSI project today. Thank you very much.